Hello there, I'm the Serial Plagiarist, and I know this review is a little late, but I had to play this game twice to truly grasp my complete thoughts on it. On my first playthrough, I live streamed it, but it isn't what I'd call usable footage. Given I dressed the Jedi Ranger like a complete ass clown, giving him a mullet the moment I unlocked it, because I wanted to go full 1980s. So it probably wasn't the best footage. Top that with the fact that I got stuck at certain points figuring out where the hell I was supposed to go, and on top of that, my commentary over what I was playing, and the little avatar in the corner pretty much demanded I re-record the game. The truth was, I had uninstalled Jedi Survivor after the first time I played it, because I was done and over with it. And besides, my PlayStation 5's hard drive wasn't that big. But then I realized, oh shit, I need to do a damn review. I gotta get back into the game. Not wanting to regain all my progress, I opted for a new game plus. Although I mostly opted for the default appearance, save for the fact that Cal Kestis was completely clean shaven. Despite what others have said, I kind of prefer the gingy Jedi without facial hair. I was probably super into his look in Fallen Order. Speaking of that game, I said in my review of it a while back that it was overrated, but still good. It was a breath of fresh air to have something from Disney Star Wars that didn't suck. And someone pointed out that perhaps its greatest weakness was being in such a garbage Star Wars continuity. Perhaps Fallen Order would have been received even better, or worse maybe, if Disney canon wasn't so horrible. Now that I've had even more time to think about it, the strength of Fallen Order was the gameplay in relation to the story. The gameplay on its own is pretty good, but it probably elevated the story to being better received than it probably deserved. Imagine if Fallen Order was a movie. The audience would not be invested in the Jedi Holocron quest in the slightest, and be especially annoyed that they have to follow some old dude's path to get the Holocron. For me, I didn't really care about the story on my first playthrough. At least when it spiked a bit when the second sister revealed that she was Seer's former apprentice. If the second sister was just a random inquisitor, I probably wouldn't have cared one bit. So that reveal, as much as I found it iffy in my review when I thought long and hard about it, saved my gameplay experience. Still though, the Holocron quest I didn't care about. Cal's personal story of living with his survivor's guilt and whatnot was more interesting. And I suppose the backdrop of the tragic end of the Clone Wars was pretty good. But the main quest on the surface? Nah, that was lame. Also, I probably should have mentioned this in my Fallen Order review, but I think Marin joined the Mantis crew way too late. I know that in the story, she had to build up to eventually trusting Cal, but given the game's main quest definitely needed a rewrite, I'm sure you could have this happen earlier. I also sucked at the game by default. I was crap on the story mode difficulty, because I never realized I should have parried or dodged when I should have. I also wanted to breeze through the enemies as soon as possible. I'm not a very patient player. Did Fallen Order deserve a sequel given the commercial success of the game? Eh, maybe. But something they absolutely had to come up with was a better main quest. I can understand if they were just starting out and they had to introduce characters and that sort of thing. Tales of the Jedi, not the Filoni knockoff edition, started much like that. The first two arcs concerning Ulic Quadroma and Nomi Sunrider weren't that interesting, but at least it set up the characters in play, and the series picked up massively after the Freedom Nad Uprising. For more information, have a look at my Tales of the Jedi review. But point is, you can kind of get away with it in a franchise as big as Star Wars. Respawn Entertainment already got the basics right. It set up characters that were worth caring about, and Fallen Order had an open-ended conclusion, even if it was very underwhelming, as it was just, so where to now? The final line could have been more interesting, you know? Still though, with the power of hindsight, if the Star Wars Jedi trilogy managed to achieve bigger and greater things in future entries, then we can just look back at Fallen Order as sort of the start that introduced the characters and story that eventually became a masterclass of storytelling or whatever. Jedi Survivor, I'd say without spoiling anything, is a definite step up from Fallen Order. 
I cared more about the main quest compared to Fallen Order. It expanded on the characters, both old and new. The gameplay was built upon, making the experience more enjoyable. And overall, the whole thing felt like quality over quantity. The moment that came the closest to feeling like filler still had my full investment. So I pre-ordered the Deluxe Edition. Just because I'm very OCD about having all the content. Quick rant here, but I hate DLC. I wish there was just one version of a game that had everything. And that companies would stop including DLC packs and season passes and deluxe gold ultimate editions. Because I'd just like it if the game is the same for everybody. Unless it's like a standalone expansion that could almost pass off as its own game. I hate DLC with a burning passion. Well... For this review of Jedi Survivor, I was one of those easiest difficulty chumps. So I'm not fit to talk about how fair or balanced the game is. I'm mostly probably going to talk about how satisfying the combat is and that sort of stuff. I was also not a completionist, so don't expect absolutely everything to be talked about. This is about the gameplay, main story, and all the super important stuff. So let's rip into this game. The game has a pretty surprising start. Because as soon as you start a new game, we're dropped into a location I didn't expect to start off with. We start on the Imperial Capital Coruscant, as Cal is seemingly being captured by the planetary police. In a long shot, we see the city of Coruscant for ourselves. A question one might have is, does this make up for Star Wars 1313 being cancelled now that we've got a modern game with Coruscant as a location? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Coruscant in the scope of the game is way too small, especially compared to the main planet of this game. Besides, in Jedi Survivor's main quest, Coruscant is for the opening only, and we visit all the locations designed for this game in the opening, and coming back is only for stuff like collectibles after you learn new abilities. You know how it goes. The story starts with you in cuffs, being escorted around the lower levels of Coruscant. It's here where you'll naturally look around as you're being escorted. And you can easily piece together that despite being the capital of the Empire, Coruscant is as strict as any other place in the Empire. There are enforced curfews, and anyone seen outside is punished severely. You can see that a certain senator from Utapau controls the area, Senator Seijen. The graphics are really, really good if I must say so myself. It truly feels like we're in the urban wide planet. On my first playthrough, I just observed everything above, below, and around me. Eventually, we are brought to the Senator, in which it's inferred that the Senator was looking for Cal Kestis, likely in an effort to gain favor with the Emperor. We get a complete reintroduction to Cal Kestis, as the Senator names off everything he's known for, and we can see now that he has an impressive reputation for causing shit for the Imperials. He's a top wanted fugitive, and as he's off monologuing, Cal's trusty droid sidekick, BD-1 shows up, and sneakily slices off his chains, and Cal snatches back his lightsaber, and it's here where the combat begins. This opening 10 minutes I should say is a great way to start the game. The game surprised me by starting off on Coruscant, and introducing the Senator character from the CGI trailer at the very start, and establishing him as an opening antagonist. This story almost starts off like an Indiana Jones movie, where the first 10 to 15 minutes have a completely different side story, before we get into the main event. Now as for combat, it's pretty much the same as Fallen Order, at least when you start the game. Cal Kestis and BD-1 maintain all the key abilities he had in the last game. That means he's got push, pull, double jump, and all that stuff. While it would be a convenient plot device to have Cal and BD-1 lose all their abilities for some reason, the developers actually forced themselves to maintain the abilities both of them obtained in the last game, and came up with new abilities that could be unlocked. So some special brownie points for getting creative and challenging yourself, instead of doing what most games do, and downscaling the player and their abilities come the sequel. Since combat starts off the same, you know what to expect. It's the parry dodge strike system seen in Fallen Order. Fortunately, I learned how important it is to parry since the last game, so you'll probably see me do it more often in this playthrough. Although I sometimes still often make mistakes in combat, 
We fight stormtroopers and scout troopers and purge troopers. The enemies you'd expect the Empire to have. I guess this time, the scout troopers and similar enemies have shields with them. And that's actually an interesting obstacle, because they are resistant to many hits. Either you force pull the shield, or you keep striking until the shield breaks, or maybe parrying to get an easy opening. The shield is a hindrance, but it isn't what I call annoying. It adds new depth to the enemy encounters, since you have more to worry about than just breaking an enemy's defense bar. I also suspect this opening multiple round fight is to get those who forgot the combat system to reinvest in the combat. I remembered what the Fallen Order combat was like, but it wasn't like this tutorial was pointless to those who already remember the combat, because this shows how strong Cal is story-wise since the last game. That's the way it's done. As the senator tries to fly away and escape, BD-1 had already gotten the ship disabled, and now the senator's ship is in limbo, but chaos causes Cal to fall off, and it's the game's clever way of reintroducing you to the climbing. Yeah, so you've got to use your trusty hands to make it to a safe platform. The climbing mechanics are pretty much the exact same. I wouldn't say this game is just a reskin of the last game, because it certainly isn't, but it's easy for someone who played Fallen Order to easily adapt and get into it if that makes sense. I'm saying this ahead of time, but I'm curious on what the third game in this trilogy will do to innovate, because I don't know how they could improve from this, aside from the story department of course. One of the stormtroopers shoot at us, and we fall onto the rooftops. We've got the classic scanning and a case of force push. Since I played this game for the second time with New Game Plus, I like how you inherit all the skill points from the last playthrough, as well as starting the game with the appearance you had upon your last save file. So if you made Cal Kestis look like a ridiculous macho man or something, you can experience that laughable look when you start a New Game Plus. As stated before, I just had the default appearance with the exception of a clean shaven face. Now something I'd like to say is that the layout is very memorable, because on my second playthrough, I was less confused on where to go than the first playthrough. The paths and environments I'd say are easier to remember than Fallen Order, which is more like an intricate maze, where Jedi Survivor is basically a semi-open world, especially on a certain planet we'll eventually go to. We'll eventually come across the security droids, and by this point, a smile was brought to my face in the sense of, I remember these guys, air assassinations are also back, as you can ambush enemies from the air. The game gradually reintroduces stuff like the double bladed saber, and it's a very good sense of nostalgia, where you remember having all these useful abilities and stuff. Flame troopers are back around this time as well, and they are pretty annoying, but the strategy is to not try and get too close to them. So eventually after climbing, you'll have a stormtrooper aim you at gunpoint, but just in time, a friend of yours shows up to save the day. Around this point, I realized that the Coruscant police officer was in fact a fake cop, and working with Cal. He shoots the stormtrooper who's about to execute Cal, and takes off his helmet. I'd say this is a pretty solid way to introduce a new character, by having him save Cal right off the bat. This is Bo Kuna voiced by one Noshi Dalal, who voiced Charles Smith in Red Dead Redemption 2, and he also voiced Admiral Rampart in The Sad Batch. Noshi Dalal has started to appear in a lot of video games, almost to the point where I'm starting to wonder whether or not he'll be a big star in the voice actor and motion capture industry. Being a pivotal character in Red Dead 2, and being notable enough to hire for not one, but two Star Wars projects, I have to say he's got quite the rising resume. It also surprised me that, as of the recording of this video, he still doesn't have a Wikipedia page, despite being in a lot of high profile video games. Like the reason I even knew he existed was because of Red Dead Redemption 2. Charles Smith is one of the most standout characters, and with that being said, I saw a lot of Charles Smith and Boda Kuna. It's that thing where since they're played by the same voice actor, you have the same impression of the character. So anyone who's played Red Dead 2, 
you'd naturally come to trust Boat as an ally. Because in Red Dead 2, Charles was a loyal and honourable member of Dutch's gang, probably one of the most morally sound of the bunch actually. I'd say Boda Kuna is well cast as a matter of fact, because Dalal is good at the characters he plays. And having him be a mercenary and sort of gunslinger, very much reminded me of Charles. He is perhaps the biggest new face of this game, and right off the bat, we trust Bode Kuna. Even if you've never played Red Dead 2, Bode comes across as a helpful, reliable friend and ally for Cal. And this is enforced by the fact that he's the first of two combat companions, in which he directly helps you in combat. Before the game released, I assumed there would be at least three, but I guess two was enough. I guess the way the story goes, the story had the perfect amount of characters. Bode as a companion helps you not only with combat, but also with puzzles. He uses his jetpack to clear the way for you to get across areas or to reach something. So they absolutely nailed the first impression we get of Bode. We meet the same kind of droid from Star Wars Rebels. And speaking of Star Wars Rebels, despite casual banter during the fight with Imperials, they at least don't treat the Empire like a joke. This game does emphasize that the Empire relies on large numbers instead of organic strength. In other words, the Empire are essentially cowards who attack only when they have the advantage of numbers. This is a much better way to present the Empire, and why characters like Cal can take them on. Because the average person not skilled in combat is forced to bow down before petty stormtroopers. But those strong enough to fight back do so. I wish Star Wars Rebels emphasized this more, instead of just making the Empire pathetic. I'd rather they be a threat like I described when they have the numbers to back them up, and the Rebels have to retreat whenever there's an overwhelming amount of stormtroopers thrown after them. Also, Jedi Survivor gets more leeway because it's a video game. It might be unfair, but the reason we believe Cal Kestis survived round after round of enemies is because we control his survival. I do agree with blurry films on different mediums in this regard. A novel story is going to be different from a video game story because the story design changes depending on what type of video game it is. Whether it be a first person shooter, open world, action adventure, role playing, strategy, etc. So after killing Imperial after Imperial, Cal comes across a new gadget, the Ascension Cable, which is essentially a grapple hook. It's an excellent addition to the game out of the new stuff they had to introduce since they didn't power down Cal in the slightest. It's also here where the pair take a break, and the both of them discuss their motivations. Since Boat is a new addition to the team, the exchange makes sense, and isn't just, let's stop the game to have the characters talk about their feelings. And Boat mentions that he has a daughter named Carter, and all his anti-imperial antics are for her. Making money is nice, but the real goal is keeping his daughter safe, although his romantic partner is long gone. Why? The Empire, of course. Most people don't fight against the Empire for no reason, as most of them either see the Empire's tyranny firsthand, or the Empire wrongs them in some way. Yeah, that's another thing I like. Even with the casual banter while killing Imperials, the characters never ever forget why they fight the Empire. Whether it be revenge or justice, or some other reason, the characters never forget that even if the average Imperial is easy to take down, the Empire remains strong. Although taking place in a separate continuity, what Ram Koda said about the Empire holds true here. It's a fool, Aaron boy. The Emperor's army is infinite. You'll eventually be killed, or worse. And nothing will have changed. Anyways, we eventually meet up with the rest of our team, including a slicer named Gabs, two twin aliens named Coob and Liz, and a Republic veteran named Bravo. The game makes it extremely obvious that everyone here except Cal and Bode will make it out alive. I mean, as soon as one character died, I knew the rest would soon follow. I kinda wish they provided full names and potential in-depth personalities for each character in this sequence. Still though, it's only a minor flaw I'd say with the writing of the prologue. The team gather round, and by now, you will have learned that you're all contracted to steal intel from the Empire by Saw Guerrera, leader of the Partisans. The three of us, this morning, I'm the only one, this evening, but I must go on. Frontiers, hold my 
prison For the wind, the wind is blowing Through the graves, the wind is blowing Freedom soon will come Then will come from the shadow Actually, he doesn't physically appear in the game, but I still wanted to play that gag. I do wish he made a cameo though, although I guess Morgan Freeman's got other things to do. Anyways, we bring the senator's yacht to us, and Cal and his team prepare to board. Bo grabs the senator, but he refuses to unlock his terminal. So we actually get a minor dialogue option, where we get to choose how to persuade him. Through either the guys that he can trust us, or that he'll be greatly rewarded. I'd like to note that me and my co-writer chose the opposite option, but they both led to the same outcome. While it is pointless to give us a dialogue option, you can at least say that they put in the effort to give us two ways of using our force persuasion powers. And it's worth noting that we can use the mind trick ability, similar to the Force Unleashed 2. Although I'd say Jedi Survivor is more useful, because in the HD version of The Force Unleashed 2, the mind-tricked enemies either commit suicide or do minimal damage. It's pathetic. You might as well just kill them. Anyhow, Cal picks up the intel, and this encounter with the Senator shows us a differing point of view. The Senator says that he cares about his people, and he secured his alliance with the Empire because it ensured his people's safety. That's another thing I wish Rebels did. Explore why people may choose not to fight the Empire beyond being too scared. Senators collaborate with the Empire because in their eyes, it's better to serve a tyrannical regime to keep your people safe. Some did it for personal gain, and here, the Senator refers that no matter how hard Cal tries, the Empire will always bounce back. They cannot be defeated. But Cal Kestis responds that he will never give in. He proclaims that the Senator's children will know one day that the Jedi never stop fighting for their freedom. So upon going outside, they're ambushed by Imperial forces, and the Ninth Sister from the last game straight up executes the Senator for collaborating with the enemies of the Empire. Yeah, the Empire has strict rules against helping rebels in any way. I'd say this is an example of the villain kills his own men cliche, done right. A lot of the time it's done poorly, but here, it's effective. Throughout this cutscene, we see the alien twins and Gabs getting killed in an instant, thinning the team in two, and leaving Cal, Bravo, and Boat as the survivors. But before Cal can clash with the Ninth Sister, a crashing ship forces Cal to jump off the ship, in which he falls into a meat grinder. And any fanatical vegans are going to shut off this game right about now. The main goal now is to make it back to the Mantis. Making his way past even more Imperial forces, there's a nice callback to Fallen Order with Cal crashing a Purge Trooper's Starfighter with the Force to pull the pilot controls. Eventually, he confronts the Ninth Sister, and the two have a duel. The Ninth Sister as a boss is ironically pretty okay. I suppose the rematch nature of it elevates it, but again, we just started playing less than an hour ago. She is able to dodge your attacks from time to time. Still though, she is the first boss, so she isn't that hard to take down. Now while I think the rematch is too soon, at least they have a satisfying conclusion to the Ninth Sister and Cal's rivalry. Cal explains who the Ninth Sister once was. Before the Ninth Sister takes her last remaining bit of energy to strike at Cal, only to be countered by an execution and then... <laughs> Anyways, we regroup with Boat and Bravo and we fight our way to our ships. It's strange how the ships weren't detained, unless the Imperials didn't know that these were the ships that belonged to the Rebels. Although this doesn't make much sense, I have to wonder based on a later revelation whether or not this is in fact a contrivance, but part of the larger story. But oh boy. We'll get to that later. Upon flying out of the lower levels of Coruscant, Bravo gets caught in Imperial Crossfire and dies. Can't say I'm too surprised given his lackluster name, but Cal and Bode make it through alright. Although for Cal personally, it's a moment of sorrow. I imagine Cal has to live with survivor's guilt 
all over again, as everyone he worked closely in jobs like this have died, and he looks at a photo he has of all of them together. Although BD1 plays recordings of the original Mantis crew, I inferred that this was to remind him that he still has those to care about in the galaxy, although they're all absent from the prologue, indicating that they all went their separate ways. The recordings are full of chemistry and banter with the Mantis crew. My favorite of the recordings has to be the one with Grease's family recipe, which he cooks for everyone, and the crew have friendly yet mocking remarks towards him. Everyone is in character in these recordings, so it's nice to have a callback. I also like that upon seeing these recordings, Cal knows exactly who to turn to after losing all but one of his team members on Coruscant. Although the average player may not realize it directly, BD-1 is a great character in his own right. He is a supportive friend to Cal Kestis, and I almost imagine the reaction if in the game after this, he is destroyed. People probably wouldn't realize how much they cared about BD-1 until the time came. Anyways, that's the Coruscant sequence over and done with. While I would say that other Star Wars games had better openings, this is a solid way to start the game. The start is full of surprises, especially starting with the fact that Coruscant is the first planet you go to in this game. Cal Kestis is shown as a stronger, wiser Jedi, fighting the Empire and narrowly avoiding death. And we can see that the Mantis crew have gone their separate ways, though not severed ties at all. Rather, it's what happens when, say, kids grow up and move out of their parents' place, and stuff like that. To get a little off-topic, I wanted to mention the utterly dreadful tie-in novel Jedi Battle Scars. Despite the cool name, the story itself does not live up to jack shit. Written by the infamous Sam Maggot, she turned what could have been an insightful read into a Lesbiano Marin fanfiction, where she hooks up with some hot alien girl and very little else. The story was completely pointless. Instead of bridging the gap between the two games, we just get some horny porno novel that indulges Sam Maggot's greatest depraved sexual fantasy, and making the characters gay just because. This is the same parasite that made Luke Skywalker bisexual. We already had Obi-Wan Kenobi bi and Pando Lando, but since writing new characters is too hard, you gotta make the legacy characters LGBT because that's an easier and much more shameless way to have feigned representation. I've said many times that Disney's so-called representation is all make-believe, given this is the same company that collaborated with the Chinese government and filmed near a concentration camp to appease them. They made Marin pansexual just because. Like apparently in Fallen Order, Marin strongly implied a gay relationship with one of her night sisters. But the key word is implied. Seeing Jedi Survivor, Battle Scars could not be more pointless. What the novel probably should have done is start with the Mantis crew splitting up and then develop the characters we see in Jedi Survivor's prologue. That being the alien twins, Gabs, Bravo, and especially Bode. Thus, anyone who reads the book and then plays Jedi Survivor feels the deaths of these characters even more. This should be common sense, of course. Prequel tie-ins always do that. A good external example would be Spider-Man Hostile Takeover. It tells its own story, but drops off just before the game starts, with the police raid on Kingpin's tower. That novel was very well received for being a tie-in prequel story that did what it was supposed to. Jedi Battle Scars, on the other hand, has no relevance to either Fallen Order or Survivor, aside from using characters from both. But in that case, the Mantis crew are written so awkwardly and out of character that I can't help but question if Sam Maggot even played Fallen Order, let alone got a pre-release copy of Survivor. Sam Maggot is a pest. She's the last person suitable to write a Star Wars story. Commonly expressing ignorance and being an insufferable Rey Skywalker defender. I hate these kinds of writers. But anyways, there's some extra criticism towards Jedi Battle Scars. One of the worst Star Wars novels I've ever read. Period. Not even Star Wars Aftermath was that pointless. Anyways, with that being said, Cal heads to a planet brand new to the Star Wars universe known as Kobo. It's quite an inspired idea to make the largest explorable world completely brand new, and having to create its own history and whatnot. While I was exploring the Mantis, however, the game designers left behind some stuff from the last game. Callbacks like the headphones Cal had on Braka, in which he mentions to BD that Prof gave them to him. You can 
can scroll through the memorabilia until you come across the last item, the Broken Holocron, in which Cal remarks that he wonders every day whether or not he made the right choice. So landing on Kobo, Cal and BD observe something resembling a bright nebula, which will be very important eventually. But on the landing, to say it's rough would be an understatement. The Mantis struggles to handle with gravity, although Cal is able to position the Mantis properly in order to prevent completely destroying it. Another happy landing. So yeah. The ship's screwed, and it won't fly again without repairs. Luckily, there's an outpost that's a reasonable distance away. And when I say that, I mean for a Jedi. There are obviously a lot of threats in between the Mantis and the settlement where Grease has his bar. Oh yes, Cal also mentioned how Grease has set up a saloon on Kobo. And it's here after navigating through some of the terrain that we're introduced to a new BD-1 ability. That being that he can use his visor like binoculars. There are several high points in the game where you can observe or map areas. Although to be honest, this is probably the one time I actually use the binoculars. But still, it's a nice, convenient feature. Another improvement Jedi Survivor has is making things more convenient, and that includes the much requested fast travel. In Fallen Order, they could sort of get away with it, because the planets weren't as big as the ones in Jedi Survivor. Making it from one side to Kobo to the other as the ultimate example would be a hassle. There's more semi-open world elements in this game, so I'm glad they provided an option for players who don't want to spend all their time going on long, unnecessary trips. As we run along the canyon, we see some familiar faces. We find battle droids. Well, actually, it's not that surprising. It was all over the trailers and marketing after all, but you'd probably be surprised if you bought the game out of hand. Maybe perhaps some 12 year old asked their mum to buy the game for them because it looked cool and they love Star Wars. Although the battle droids are incorporated as reprogrammed units meant to fight for a group of vicious attackers known as the Bedlam Raiders. The welcoming committee is hostile. The Bedlam Raiders attack on sight and there's no reasoning with them. Ledge attacks are also executable. For most of Kobo, you'll be either fighting wildlife or the Bedlam Raiders. Speaking of the wildlife, while they do start off with mostly Bedlam Raiders, the wildlife is unique and interesting. While Tatooine, for example, would easily top it, this is what I meant when I said it was an inspired idea to have the main planet be completely new to Star Wars. Yeah, that's something Jedi Survivor already does better than the sequels. Originality with planets. So enemies in the opening Kobo sequence are mostly standard raiders and then B1 and B2 battle droids. As stated in the IGN combat presentation, they showcased all different kinds of enemies. The game wasn't falsely advertised, unlike The Last of Us Part 2, and the enemies do different things to throw you off. The B1 battle droids, for example, are useless as a one-off enemy, but are more dangerous in larger numbers. Still, they're just as inefficient as stormtroopers. Matthew Wood reprises his role to voice the battle droids, and they continue the funny battle droid banter seen in the Clone Wars. Some highlights navigating to the settlement include encountering these bombs that move towards you, and they're actually involved in a puzzle solving sequence. Another improvement from Fallen Order is that the puzzles have been scaled down, and aren't made to boggles one mind with confusion and the whole, what the fuck am I supposed to do problem. The puzzle in this sequence is raising the amount of tar or whatever the that black gooey stuff is supposed to be. So you'll know that you're well on your way when you get the cutscene with the large creature, in which BD1 goes to scan it prematurely, and after a fright, Cal warns BD1 to be careful about who he scans. While inconsequential in the rest of the game, it's a little bonding moment between Cal and BD1, so we've still got a bit more navigation to do, in the form of fighting more Bedlam Raiders, as well as encountering a Boggling, which Cal remarks is a long way from Bagano. They introduce you to wall jumping, which is something you can also do in Super Mario. Eventually, You'll make it to a clear side of the Kobo town where Grease is held up. We meet a local resident named Mosey. Something that occurred to me is that she sounds like she belongs in Red Dead Redemption 2, which is funny since Noel Sheer Delal is in this game too. So anyways, we navigate the town. This is probably the area that emphasizes an improvement from the last game. Interaction. In Fallen Order, it felt like you were very isolated from the galaxy. 
almost like we were in the uncharted regions of space. But here, there's actually some civilization and interactivity. I stopped to interact with at least two residents around Kobo. The interactions don't mean much, but hey, you can get insightful interactions between Cal and whoever, but they don't relate to the main story. So let's just get on with it. When we eventually get to the door of Grease's Cantina, we encounter two new characters. Bursting out of the door is fan favorite supporting character Turgle, who is vulnerable and begging for his life against some Bedlam Raiders. And we get those iconic shots from the trailer, in which Cal, being who he is, demands the Raiders let him go. And to emphasize the threat level more, we get the introduction of a massive Gendai character, Ravis, who comes to be more of a supporting antagonist of this game. He monologues about how Turgle sold him a priceless relic, except the thing turned out to be no good. And I love the way he does so, ending with two words. It's fake! Damn, someone make that a meme. Let's just say that somebody at Respawn knows how to pace out dialogue and exchanges. Anyways, the ruthless Ravis decides to execute Turgle, that is until Cal steps in, using force push to ensure Turgle's safety and chance to run. Doing so, he reveals that he's a Jedi, and Ravis is pleasantly surprised, telling his goon to kill Cal, also with that line from the trailer. Remind our friend here why his kind are supposed to be dead. The kind of boss fight we get is piss easy and quick. I suppose we were meant to demonstrate our skills for the sake of the story. Upon defeating the goon, Cal draws his lightsaber at Ravis and tells him to get lost or he'd wish he was roadkill. Ravis agrees when he asks Cal to deactivate his saber and leaves peacefully, remarking that he'll be seeing him again. Immediately after, Turgo pops up again. Overexcited that someone finally stood up to the Bedlam Raiders. We get a brief interaction with the Merchant Doma, and now we're free to enter Grease's bar, Pyloon Saloon. We see that the bar is relatively nice looking, and we're greeted by Grease's bartender droid Monk. Cal asks for Grease, and Grease literally walks in, after hiding, and he slowly realizes after noticing BD-1 that Cal is in his bar as well. They handle this reunion pretty well, with the two hugging, and it's thankful to say that they kept the writing for Grease consistent, and they almost completely ignored Jedi battle scars, if it wasn't for the mechanical arm. Still, no comment is made about the arm, as it's just a visual detail. The two have some welcome banter that usually gives us additional information about the status of the Mantis crew. C is working on, quote, a project, and Merrin is out wandering the galaxy and whatnot, basically becoming an explorer. With all that being said, Grease invites Cal down to the restaurant's basement, as he has a spot made specifically for him. So thus far, they nailed the reunion between Cal and Grease. There was sufficient build-up and a sufficient payoff. It's wholesome, and the chemistry between the two shines. Going down to the basement, there's actually a bunch of stuff down there, including Cal's Scrapper Guild clothes, ironically. I also believe that some ponchos can be found somewhere, although I didn't explore the game enough to find them. I have seen clips of those more adventurous than me, but other than that, I couldn't be fucked. So we go down to have a rest, and Cal wakes up to Grease right in his face, and it's here where we get another insightful conversation between the two. We see that Grease personally wants to settle down away from the Empire, and advises Cal to do the same, because the Empire is the dominant power in the galaxy, and they're completely unstoppable. Grease remarks that Cal himself said that the Empire only grows stronger every day, and that he's got to know to walk away from a rigged game. As one of Grease's more serious moments, it's actually touching in a way. They demonstrate how even the most rebellious Jedi can't take down a galactic empire, no matter how much damage they do. It took a fully organized joint rebellion to do that, and they only barely achieved it through fatal mistakes and cracks the Empire made that were exploited. One group alone could not stop the Empire. It was thanks to all the rebel cells uniting that they were able to defeat the Empire. Cal, however, is persistent in fighting the Empire, while Grease just encourages him to give up. Not harshly, but just lay down, find a home, and just live life as a normal person in the galaxy. Unlike Star Wars Rebels, they actually emphasize the threat of the Empire. That they have near infinite resources, and it seems futile to stand up against them. 
So anyways, Grease says that there's a smuggler's tunnel connected to the saloon, in which he keeps spare parts and whatnot. And Cal will probably find parts to fix the mantis there. Although there is a quote unquote pest problem. So upon exploring these tunnels, it doesn't seem that interesting at first. But BD1 and Cal eventually fall down into some new scenery. The textures are different. And you can tell that this will be a major instigator for the story. When I first played this, I knew this would be some sort of High Republic thing. That turns out to be exactly correct, as we make our way across the ruins in which we come across an antique droid, clearly from the High Republic, and upon touching it, Cal's Force Echo ability allows him to see a pivotal memory of the droid. We get a flashback to an unspecified amount of time, Although everyone can tell it's the Woke Republic. Yes, I'm calling it that. Shut up. We see through the droid's memory that its master was a Woke Republic Jedi named Centauri Kree, who urgently calls the droid in question. This is all done from a first person perspective with a blur effect, and it's actually pretty interesting. I was a bit startled, admittingly, that we're going for something similar to Fallen Order, although the story is more interconnected than Fallen Order. And it isn't just a flat out pointless quest for a holocron. You see, I describe Fallen Order's story as more of an experience of going to different planets and learning about the galaxy post Clone Wars. The game reminds you of the Clone Wars a lot, that was a mere five years ago in the timeline. Anyways, Santari Kree is shown as a Jedi, and piecing together the conversation, the droid is having part of his memory wiped. The droid through dialogue is shown to have female programming and is named ZNA4, or Z for short. Yeah, in Australia, we pronounce the last letter of the alphabet Z instead of Z, but I'm still going to call the droid Z because that's how they wanted you to pronounce her name. There's a Kobo Abyss mentioned, and the droid talks about how there's a full-scale evacuation order on this planet. Santari proceeds to give Z a key of sorts, referred to as a tuner. Santari orders Z to go underground and stay there. Mentioning a key to Tanalor, what on earth could she be talking about? Well, what are stories but mystery boxes? Anyways, out of the flashback, Z in the present reveals that she's still got power. I presume it's a low power mode thing she did. I'm not gonna ask how she was able to stay active for 200 years or so, given the Ricard Android in KOTOR that stayed active for tens of thousands of years. So Cal already catching Z's name in the flashback, introduces himself in BD to Z, and upon asking for help getting free, Cal agrees to help. So yeah, a puzzle sequence. And again, way simpler and easier. There's humorous dialogue spoken through all of this, where Z remarks that Cal's not wearing the proper ropes, and Cal responds, I'm more of a poncho guy for some reason. For some reason, I like to imagine that was a line that Cameron Monaghan improvised. How has Cal evolved since we last saw him? What's going on with him? <sighs> well, first thing I notice is he's not wearing a poncho. In Cameron! Well, the puzzle mostly includes connecting floating balls up to X-Path and opening doors with a rope and whatnot. After freeing Z, Cal helps her with her rusted, inefficient leg and starts asking about Tantalor, in which she's informed that Tantalor is a planet hidden in the so-called Kobo Abyss, and home to a Jedi Temple. Now Z as a character, exhibits the enjoyability of droids when done right. Z has a joyful, upbeat voice, and they nailed this supporting character. I enjoyed her presence whenever in this game. The droid also has a unique way of walking and moving. I guess to heavily contrast with modern Star Wars technology. She's a very old droid by the standards of Disney Star Wars, but still manages to be energetic. Cal doesn't outright tell Z that it's been 200 years, give or take, since she found herself lost. Cal himself expresses an interest in Tantalor, asking questions during the elevator ride up to the town. Z realizes on her own seeing some building in the town that she's been away for a long ass time. Cal is supportive, and tells her that she'll be able to get back on her feet. Anyways, returning to the cantina, we see that Bodes show up, and Grease is in the middle of pretending he doesn't know Cal. 
It's hilarious as Cal walks in, but it does show Grease's loyalty, that he's not giving up Cal so easily to a stranger, so thanks Grease. Cal introduces Bo to Grease, as well as Z when she comes in. Turns out Grease has heard of Tanalor, and he gets all excited. As he explains that from what he's heard, it's a prospector's legend of a place full of treasure, and he says it almost like a stereotypical pirate. Grease and Bo agree to go fix the Mantis, while Z asks Cal to complete her mission, going to the forest array and opening it. And so begins the quest for Tanalor. The story actually progresses into something larger scale, and doesn't feel kinda pointless and hollow like the Jedi Holocron. And it becomes incredibly interesting once you're on this quest. I did want to say though that something about the first two hours left me burnt out on both playthroughs. I don't know. I just felt kind of exhausted after this. It's not like I wanted to stop playing the game. I was obviously going to come back tomorrow, but it's worth noting that I had, well, a feeling. Also, in the back of my mind, I knew the first meeting with Ravis would account to something related to this. So there's that. So let's talk about getting over to the forest array. So our quest will take us outside the Kobo town against Bedlam Raiders, who of course have Separatist battle droids as backup. After dealing with them, we use the Turner Z gave us to open the forest gate. And now it's time to make it to the forest array. This takes us to a mountainy-ish area, and it's also here where we see our first batch of Imperials on Kobo. Some of them will be fighting the Bedlam Raiders, and it reminds me of the Empire vs. Separatist mission from Battlefront 2. We've also got some Kobo Dust stuff that swarms all over you, and you have to do everything to avoid it. Otherwise, it's straight back to the checkpoint. After passing the first batch, you'll make it all the way to the forest array. And the design of the place tells you it's got some super ultra secret important thing inside. Of course, we gotta navigate and climb a fuck ton in order to make it. Highlights in fact include a bird that is stuck on some Kobo matter that you help free. As well as a warmer climate variant Wampa who straight up ambushes you and you gotta kill it. You got some more puzzles to solve and then we unlock one of our new abilities for this game. The ability to tame a Relta. These glidey flying creatures. Just like Fallen Order, Cal remembers something. Although this time, it's advice from Sia. In which she advises that she doesn't perceive everything as a threat. So yeah, we tame the Relta and it lets us ride it. Despite the fact that we're essentially heavy poundage to it. This was one of the marketed new abilities. And while it is something very simple to add, it's still a nice addition. It allows you to further feel the sense of adventure and exploration. Remember at the end of the day that this is a Jedi adventure game? Keyword adventure. So we use our newfound friends to glide in and ambush some Imperials dicking around the forest array. It's here where we make our way to this supreme elevator, in which it takes us to the rehabilitation wing. And you know it's an important story moment given the layout, and the fact there's a meditation point. And you know if you've seen any of the trailers, this is going to be the introduction of a highly speculated back to tank boy. The most popular theory was that it was Jura Sabayoth. Was that accurate? Nah, the speculation was wrong. This is a brand new character. Cal opens the ceiling for the back to tank, and he sees a dude missing an arm, floating around in the tank. He moves to touch the tank, and we're presented with another flashback. Quick pause. If Jedi Battle Scars wasn't going to be about the in-between to Jedi Fallen Order and Survivor, it could have been about the Woke Republic shit seen in this game. I mean, the Woke Republic seems to be more of Sam Maggot's forte anyways. Again, a missed opportunity. I feel like calling that novel Star Wars baby shit, because that's its quality for real. Anyways, we see the guy in the tank is Dagon Gera, and upon touching the tank, Cal gets a little bit of backstory on this guy. The first flashback shows us that he's a friend of the previously shown Centauri Kree. We see that they're both on Tanalor, which of course has a different look and design than Kobo. After this first flashback, we get to control Cal through the rest of the flashbacks. We see that Dagon is fully happy with the uncharted world he's discovered, and plans to build a Jedi temple. But then we see a more distressing memory, where Dagon mentions Opo Rancisus, a background character from the Phantom Menace debating with the Council for a long ass time. And then we see an unfriendly fleet showing up. 
This all culminates in Dagon turning to Cal and breaking the flashback by asking him to release him. So as for this whole flashback sequence, they do what they're designed to do. Create intrigue. Not exactly something that'll entice me into reading woke Republic novels, but still, the visuals were also pretty stunning during all this. Perhaps someone encountered a glitch during all this on release day, but I made it through fine. The game was functional when I played it, and that's what I care for for the most part. So with that being said, nice flashbacks. Although the story of Dagon Gera gets sort of downhill after that, Cal releases Dagon from the tank, retrieving his lightsaber, and he allows Dagon the room to breathe, before catching him up to speed on what's been going on since the Woke Republic. That being that conservative palps took over the Woke Republic and turned it into an empire. We see Dagon suspiciously quiet. He doesn't directly respond to Cal's recap of events, and upon taking his lightsaber back, he puts it down on the console. And he does that classic Disney canon thing of corrupting his lightsaber crystal and turning it red. And he does it at a record fast speed. Damn, I didn't know bleeding crystals worked like that. They do a good amount of build up slowly making us realize that Dagon is bad news. He becomes furious when he rants about how Tanalor was abandoned by the Jedi and they expected to have him just throw it all away. We see that he has officially turned to the dark side and Cal unknowingly at the time let him go to cause damage. Any attempts to reason with Dagon remain futile and yeah it's a boss fight. Now again I played this on story mode but I can say that Dagon is pretty easy here as someone who's missing his arm. I suppose they intentionally made this easy as a starter off. After all, this is Dagon's first interaction with anyone else in 200 years, give or take. First impressions, he seems like the main bad guy, and for the most part, he is. Let me say first hand though, that all he ever seems to talk about is Tanner Law, and he becomes mostly just an obstacle that stands in your way, and that results in him being pretty one dimensional. Maybe two dimensional if we're being generous, but he is perhaps a super shallow villain writing wise. He sure as hell doesn't ruin the story with the weak writing, it's just that I always felt there was something missing with Dagon's character. After we hold off long enough against him, Ravis from earlier busts open the area with a Republic era gunship, in which Dagon congratulates him for excellent timing, and also never forgetting his oath to him. The pair escape, and now the obvious villain is obvious. So with this important piece of the story completed, it's time to navigate back to the Mantis and the town. This time around we'll get rideable mounts that we can use to climb uphill slopes, and other normally inaccessible areas on foot. And we enter that location from the trailers that include the Jawa Sandcrawler settlement. To be honest, this part really kind of confuses me, but I didn't waste too much time here. It's just worth pointing out that this is perhaps my least favourite place to go exploring in this entire game, brutally honest. So upon returning to the Mantis, we meet up with Z, who encourages us to persevere, even after she herself has been caught up to speed on what happened in the past 200 or so years. Although she decides not to come along. She'll stick around the cantina. So basically entering the Mantis, which has been fully repaired, we meet up with Bone and Grease, and we speak to them on what happened in the forest array. Still though, they reason that the path to Tanalor is too good of an opportunity to pass up. So both Grease and Bode agree that it's an ideal place to hide from the Empire. Bode in particular reasons that it's better than any one score, because being away from the dominion of the Empire is a dream come true essentially. This is where we get some setup for a new planet, since Cal remarks that if anyone knows about a lost Jedi world, it's Seer, and it's here where you'll start getting that reunion vibe if you haven't already. First Grease. Now Seer, and Seer in particular is on the world of Jedha from Rogue One. So to describe this scene, this is where the characters fully get the motivation to get to Tanalor. And while you can tell it probably won't work out in the end, as by the timeline, you can still buy the team's enthusiasm. This pretty much makes Tanalor a stronger drive than the Jedi Holocron from Fallen Order. So while mostly a scene for setup, it sells the journey a hell of a lot more than last time. You can more easily follow along with the characters and want what they want. Superb stories immerse you into the situation with the characters, and you can imagine yourself with them. It's probably because of the interactive nature of the game, you feel like you are Cal Kestis to an extent. 
which is doubly so for me, because Cal Kestis is probably the Star Wars protagonist that I most closely resemble in real life. I guess they can't go woke with a white male protagonist like Cal, and that's what led to him being as liked as he is, because I couldn't hide behind the character's gender or race to mask poor writing. Alright, so with all that being said, it's now our clear path to Jedi. Of all places, I wondered, why Jedi? But come to think of it, it was actually kind of clever. Since this sub-series is pretty much an action-adventure game, Jedi has a lot of explorable places. Like, even glimpsing at Rogue One, there was a statue of a Jedi half buried in the sand. I somewhat suspect that this is all meant to tie into the woke Republic backdrop this game has with characters like Dagon Gera, because I believe there's a novel in that series called The Battle for Jedi or something. Anyways, making our way to Jedi, Grease remarks that Seer's place is holed up in the desert. So we aren't going anywhere near the city that will eventually be destroyed in Rogue One. Seer is among a group called the Anchorites, and one of them contacts us, telling us to land somewhere nearby, and meet up with an escort. Who will take us to Seer's place? That is kind of an excuse for more exploration, to be honest, but it does allow for meaningful interactions. So that's more of a nitpick than anything. So yeah, we land in the middle of the desert. There's a lot of climbing up a steep hill, which eventually leads us to some old ruins, where we will meet our first Imperial Patrol. Although they're not the only thing you need to deal with, as there's something comparable to the sandworm in Jedi Academy that will grab you as long as you're standing in the plain sand. If you didn't already know, I hated that thing. It was the bane of my existence and I'd only play that mission for an additional force power level. Anyways, we narrowly avoid that scary scorpion or whatever it's supposed to be, and this is where you'll get your first look at jet troopers. And believe me, these guys are somewhat annoying, because they often reject force push or pulls, and you can't exactly jump up and just slash at them aggressively. In fact, if you try to pull them with an adaptive trigger, it won't budge. I was playing this game on my PlayStation 5, and I had that on. After defeating that, we avoid the scorpion again, and after that, we sneak around the Empire until we try climbing down, and we're intercepted by one of those motherfucking jet troopers, who grab us, and upon punching him off, in which we stab him with our lightsaber, we slide down, and take out the Imperial ambush. But thankfully for us, the contact we were supposed to meet helps us. And much to my surprise, it's Night Sister Marin. She uses her fancy Night Sister force powers to make short work of the poor stormtroopers who probably just wanted to provide for their families. Ah! Sorry, I felt like humanizing the Empire for a minute there. Anyways, both Cal and Marin greet each other, and they team up in fighting more Imperials. And this is where we see that Marin is our second combat companion, after Bo. As it turns out, there's actually the two of them only who can be combat companions. Marin is useful in her Night Sister magic skills. We also meet some DT sentry droids from Rebels again, because enemy variety is this game's strong suit. Anyways, after taking them all out, Marin as our escort accompanies us on the way to Seer's place. Marin helps us navigate by using her Night Sister magic to assist us getting up places, now that we've acquired an ascension cable. Since Marin's got a land speeder nearby, we head over to it and ambush the Imperials that surround it. Although unfortunately, the land speeder ends up completely destroyed. So upon finishing the Imperials, now that Meren's ride is busted, Cal suggests riding on the native Spammels. Fun fact, they were actually based on the concept art for Rogue One, but didn't make it into the final film. So instead, they're being repurposed for this game. So it's nice that they did that. The banter between Cal and Meren is pretty quippy. It's the same sort of style a lot of games have with navigation dialogue. But it works. One of the things they talk about is how Marin at one point returned to Dathomir to learn from her deceased sisters and whatnot. We also learn after we take out more stormtroopers that they're resorting to nicknaming Marin the Desert Ghost. And after a bit of navigating, we get a boss fight with the scorpion thing, where we learn it's called a Scripton, or something like that. And we see that it's got one small and one large claw on opposite sides. Well, maybe we wouldn't sound so bad if some people didn't try to play with big meaty claws. What did you say, punk? <laughs> big meaty claws! This thing is sort of tough to hit. 
because its big claw is immune to damage if you attack it from that angle. But aside from that, with Meryn helping you, it can't defend itself against the both of you at once. So there's that. After this boss fight, we finally have access to the Spammel, which we easily tame, and we mutually ride across the desert. And we get a brief conversation where Cal expresses disappointment that the crew went their separate ways. Although any extended chat doesn't last long, because a sandstorm kicks in randomly at the most inconvenient time. The Spammel then kicks Cal and Meryn off, and now we need to find some shelter. The visuals and presentation is pretty well done. They do a good job at selling the severity of the weather. We fight some more Imperials, including our first ATST mini boss, as there's many more to come. After this, we find our shelter, and in comes another cutscene. Cal and Meryn start a campfire, with Meryn of course using her magic to start the fire, giving a unique green colour. Just wanted to point out that unique detail. But anyways, Cal and Meryn sit down next to each other, and talk about more of that personal stuff. This scene shows us that Cal and Meryn appreciate each other's company. Meryn talks about leaving in order to find herself in the galaxy and whatnot. And then the moment that made the premature Cal Meryn shippers cream their pants. They somewhat cuddle with each other, although nothing obvious that indicates a romance. When I first played this game, I just fucking knew that Respawn Entertainment put in a scene like this to taunt us. Listen, like I said in the Fallen Order review, I was never some hardcore Cal Meryn shipper. I actually avoid doing ships in general, because I don't really care that much, and it can get messy. People can blind themselves with their personal fantasies, and it can lead to disappointment in the story and play. So yeah, you already know my take about this. And a lot of what Respawn did in this sequel was based on fan feedback, such as when they included fast travel points. Because most players didn't feel like walking all the time. Anyways, the hideout is not far away come the next morning, and upon Cal Force pushing the door open, we are greeted by... Eno Cordova. Yeah, that's right. A character I presume most people assume died is actually still around. And the character up close is actually really something. Surprise, to be sure, but a welcome one. Believe me, there's actually a noticeable difference between Cordova in a hologram and Cordova in person. So yeah, this was a nice surprise the game gave us. They also shot this surprise effectively too. Cal also speaks for the audience by saying that he never thought he'd meet him in person. Cordova in this sudden surprise also lives up to any impression you could have of him. He feels like the perfect Jedi. Encouraging, compassionate, kind, etc. When walking across the base, he pretty much indicates that he was outside the known galaxy looking for the Zepho during the rise of the Empire, and after failing, he sought out other Jedi survivors. Roll credits, and met up with Seer once again. So yeah, even though he is a supporting character at best, and doesn't really get any development, he is a nice surprise the writers threw in. Anyways, when Cordova tells us to go meet Seer, we go to her, and we see what seer has been up to since the last game. When the crew parted ways, she decided to become part of the Hidden Path, first introduced in Kenobi. To be honest, I was sort of caught off guard when they were making a reference to Kenobi, given how horrible that whole thing was. But I'm thankful to say that they give the Hidden Path a way better introduction in this game. She's also working on restoring the Jedi Archives, given the Empire seized the Jedi Temple around 10 years ago. And as I hear, in Disney canon specifically, the Emperor turned it into his palace. Ironic. Anyways, we have that reunion moment between everyone from the last game, as well as Cal introducing Bo to Seer and Cordova. After all this, Cal starts changing the subject to Tanalor, and Cordova mentions that there's two leads he found in the partially restored archives relating to Dagon Gera. The first being that he has an estate of sorts on Kobo, and also the fact that there's a research station on Kobo's moon, so they're both worth investigating. The game actually allows you to go to either location in the order that you want. For me personally, I decided to go back to Kobo first, because that's what we're familiar with, and then go to Kobo's moon. However, to summarize the entirety of the first stage of Jenna, I quite like it. It has Cal reunite with both Marin and Seer in a well-paced manner, 
Plus, his interactions are very meaningful with the both of them. Plus, the surprise of seeing Cordova really helped my investment in the story. So, I'm going back to Kobo first as stated that it's my preference. And then we'll talk about the research station. It's also worth noting that this is where you get your blaster stance, which personally I had zero care for. The blaster was kind of impractical for me, and I preferred to get up close and personal anyways. Anyhow, I set my preferred path, so let's talk about Kobo first. Upon returning to Kobo, we have to head over to what is described as an abandoned facility on the east side of the valley. We get on another Relta to glide to the other side, and on the second one, the graphics actually look quite nice. Observing the game's environment is something that you'll do sometimes, and it looks quite nice. The sense of scale despite being a semi-open world game is quite vast. The relters are used to glide more and more upwards in altitude, and you'll have to solve quite a few puzzles in order to get higher and higher in elevation, until you get to the facility. The anticipation for getting up to the top was not at all frustrating. This is at the end of the day a game with expiration, and navigation as a key game mechanic. The enemy variety you'll meet around here are some more Bedlam Raiders. Not surprising that's whom Dagon Guerra and Ravis control. I mentioned puzzles, and to be frank, they aren't that hard. They made sure to tone down all the puzzles come the sequel, so any problem solving is easily achievable by casual players. Anyways, let's just get straight to the point since I believed I described the exploration decently enough. Upon entering the estate to progress, we come across a little mini-boss named Tag Loesch, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and he ironically also wields a lightsaber. But he isn't too hard. But then again, I wouldn't truly know. I played on the easiest difficulty because I'm a chump. Anyways, we come across a strange device of note where we get another flashback, in which we see this device was so important to Dagon that he killed another Jedi for it. I like how this random character in the flashback is called, quote, Bold Jedi. You are a bold one. I don't know. That's just an observation I made. Anyways, that's enough of the main story on Kobo for now. Let's get onto its moon to progress the story. I would like to stress how handy the fast travel system is, since I used it to get all the way back to the landing pad. My only gripe with fast travel is that it's limited to one planet. So if you want to go from Kobo to Jetta, for example, you have to go to the Mantis and it delays things quite a bit. In the main story, it doesn't matter. But when you want to complete side quests with efficiency and speed, you're out of luck. You gotta go through the Mantis. So if there was ever an improvement I'd suggest for Jedi 3, whatever it will be called, it's that. Anyways, we head over to the shattered moon of Kobo, and just like all the other worlds, this moon sets itself apart from the other locations. It's got a moody, abandoned atmosphere. It actually kind of resembles the Mars facility seen in Doom 2016, key difference being that it's bluish instead of reddish, but the resemblance is there. Anyways, navigating this place is as I described. There's the usual climbing, but there's also zip lines with BD-1. Side note. I was a bit terrible with jumping from zipline to zipline when I was required to, and I ended up falling to my death, or in this game, losing a bit of health. The enemy selection around here includes Bedlam Raiders and the reprogrammed droids that serve them. There isn't much story through the navigation, so let's just skip it when we come across a similar device, in which we're ambushed by another dude with a lightsaber in which we kill him and we unlock the cross guard. The one crybaby Ren uses. They actually use the cross guard as something more than a gimmicky toy, as it plays more like a heavy axe that can break defenses but is pretty slow. The speed is why I didn't use this style much, but I can understand someone else's use for it. With both our objectives complete, we can return to Jeddah. A side conversation I quite like in this game is when we're returning to Jeddah and Grease talks about how he owes Seer around 2,000 credits for starting Pyloon Saloon and remarks that maybe she'll forget about the debt if he makes her a meal. And Cal says that it better be one hell of a meal. In fact, another exchange that gives off chemistry is when we go into the archive and I spoke to Meryn right before we spoke to Cordova and Meryn makes a remark that Cordova has the best sense of humor. And when Cal points out there's literally only two other Jedi she's met, she's like, exactly. Anyways, we bring the pair of devices to Cordova, who gives no promises that he can fix it, 
but he will try. We then get a report that an Imperial excavation team is approaching a hidden path safe house, and the guy in charge, Brother Armias, isn't responding. So he's probably in trouble. Merrin and Cal volunteer to help out, and that's where we get some more bonding between the two. In the pacing of the whole thing, I think that they give enough time developing each returning character in relation to Cal. The bunch of them get along in their own different ways. So anyways, we ride across the desert with Spammels, and we access a new area of Jeddah, and it's more teaming up with Merrin. We gradually make our way across the ruins, getting closer and closer to the safe house. I will say that I did get confused sometimes, like this area, where we had a super short rope to open a door, and I was confused on it for a bit. The navigation is vast, and feels like quite a journey. This is where we get around to an area, and we learn a new force ability, Force Dash. A power that can be used during mid-jump, and something we can also use to get past the wind. Once again, they really did get quite creative when they forced themselves to give Cal new abilities on top of the old ones. Force Dash is quite a fast, fluent, and fun ability. It's even more useful than it was in the Force Unleashed. And speaking of the Force Unleashed, I'll have another comparison to make with that game. Shortly after learning Dash, we come across a massive excavator droid that largely reminds me of the large boss droid from the Force Unleashed 2. This droid though is even larger and quite intimidating. I'm also happy that Disney let them get away with something this big. Their canon has been incredibly rigid and boring, and especially in video games, we don't get anything that impressive like we did in, say, The Force Unleashed. This excavator droid in a video game is a step in the right direction. Because Star Wars video games should not be taken too literally in relation to gameplay versus story. That's what people don't understand about The Force Unleashed. Anyways, we do a bunch of climbing, war running, and killing. Eventually we make it to the safe house, and Imperials are all around. We also do some swimming ironically too. Anyways, we meet up with Brother Armias, and he gives us some contact codes, and stresses that we must take it back to Seal, and the Empire must not capture it. And then he gets crushed by the excavator droid. And it's gone. Marin gives us access to a new ability, titled Meren's Charm, which allows us to go through any darn force field that we want. It's also worth noting that we can renew every force dash with every force field we go through, so that enhances the flow of gameplay a lot. We get a pretty exciting escape sequence, in which we run as fast as we can to get away from the excavator droid with our newfound abilities. It's like playing a high-scale action movie. Point is is that it's pretty engaging, and a highlight in this game sequences. There's some more slashing our way through enemies, and then we get another cutscene. And it's the type of scene where the characters in the middle of a chase scene express that they're either cornered or trapped. And much to the delight of certain players, Meryn asks Cal if he trusts her. And the moment she said that, I was like, oh we're going there are we? Yeah. Just to prove that Jedi Battle Scars was an absolute joke of a novel, Marin proceeds to kiss Cal, much to the delight of the shippers. And if you know me, I was never a shipper. I preferred to see what writers would do with the characters. My favourite part probably isn't even the kiss itself, but rather Cal's oblivious response. As someone with the upbringing of a Jedi, he says, quote, was that for luck? Yeah, that's the kind of writing I like, honestly. If you introduce a Jedi character, you gotta write them appropriately. Anakin Skywalker is a tad different since he wasn't born a Jedi, but rather was adopted into the Order at age 9, being old enough to develop certain worldviews. Point is, Cal's sort of oblivious response is perfectly in line with his character, and I like how they took the appropriate steps with this subplot. Although again, what was the point of Jedi Battle Scars? As I said, that book had a shitty lesbian romance with Marin and some other chick, when Sam Maggot should have been bridging the gap between the two games. I don't know about you, but I would have preferred more hints at Cal and Marin's relationship, and should have been building towards implying chemistry between the two, rather than a lesbiano's wet dream. Anyways, Respawn certainly hurt the shippers, but at least they took the appropriate steps. So moving on, we jump through another portal after another in a batshit crazy sequence until we proceed to assist Meryn in force feeding the droid its own parts back to it. One final jump, 
and we've dealt with this sequence for good. So I have to say this part of the game was absolutely a highlight. Seems like a lot of effort went into intimidating the player with a giant droid, and the struggle to evade and defeat it. It makes for a unique experience, and the closest I felt to being immersed in something like this before was the Nintendo Wii version of The Force Unleashed 2, which contrary to the main versions, I like a lot. Upon returning to the hideout, we inform Seer that the dude didn't make it, but the intel concerning the hidden path is safe. Then we go over to Cordova, and he gives us a history lesson based on the Kobo Abyss. Basically, our ticket to Tanalor rests in searching for a certain compass, and so it's back to Kobo. On top of that, Marin decides to join the Mantis crew, much to the unprepared shock of Grease. I gotta love the interactions between Grease and anyone else. However, they throw in a conflict to keep us on our toes. Upon landing on Kobo, Turgle informs us that the Bedlam Raiders attacked the town and took Z. The Raiders are set up at a Crash Separatist Lucra Hulk. The last time we entered a Lucra Hulk in a Star Wars game was Republic Commando. Key difference being that Commandos were still space worthy. The whole point was to download codes and then destroy the darn ship. When we get to the general area, we use BD as binoculars and use it to scout out the area. Like previous missions, we're teaming up with Bode. The Lucra Hulk as we approach it is pretty impressive as a set piece. The environment being muddy, with a crash separatist ship really sold the atmosphere. It reminds me of the last game's references to the Clone Wars. While references to the Clone Wars directly have dampened, the memory of what happened still persists, which is a small detail I'll give praise for. It actually feels like there's been a tad amount of time. In this case, five since Fallen Order. This area also gives an explanation on where the Bedlam Raiders got the battle droids. The Lucra Hulk must have came with such a fresh supply. So yeah, we team up with Bo to eliminate those darn clankers. There's also a fair bit of climbing, which is probably the most compelling it has been in the whole game. The Lucra Hulk may be the most fun area to navigate and explore on Kobo, and it's not like the other locations were lacking either. The area we had to navigate to get to Dagon Gera was pretty cool too and had a lot of unique imagery. The Lucra Hulk really does remind me of Republic Commando. The feeling on being on the Separatist ship and fighting battle droids is a unique experience. Obviously Jedi Survivor has its differences, but still, I'm pretty happy that we got a modern version of a feeling I had playing Republic Commando. This is around the time they introduced destroyer droids, I believe. They play how you'd expect. Shielded enemies, although the shields can be easily penetrated. I didn't have such a hard time with them, but reminder once again, I'm playing on the easiest difficulty. Anyways, one thing of note is banter that leads up to a cutscene, with Boat asking Cal about Marin. Yeah, they took the time to have conversations about other members of the Mantis. Although here, you can tell that Boat is sort of teasing Cal about Marin, heavily indicating that he knows about their history. After that, we spot Z on an elevator a distance away. We cause more chaos for the Bedlam Raiders, and we also come across a major heavy enemy as well. Eventually, we make it to a locked door, and the game slows down a bit to give the characters some breathing room. I mean, it's not out of place since the characters had no major problems with the enemies, but anyways, Bo continues that conversation about Meren I mentioned earlier. It's directly referenced here that Bo can easily tell that Cal kinda has feelings for Meren, and as such, he talks to Cal about trusting his heart. Cal, of course, is hesitant to follow the advice because of the whole attachments thing, but this is a step in the eventual direction for Cal and Meren. However, they don't have all day to talk about it when a white force shield comes up, and the two have to split up for the sake of the mission. After this cutscene, we navigate an area that is all too quiet. You can tell straight away that they're building up for tension, and it's effective. We walk around in the dark, until we're ambushed by who else but Ravis, in which Cal tries to stab him in the chest, but if you've seen the Clone Wars micro series, you know that Gendai don't go down that easily. And we even get a reference to one of Grievous's iconic lines. You're a bull, <laughs> He 
said it. He said it. Ravis takes the New Republic tuna Z gave us earlier in the game, and just before Cal is crushed, Cal manages to slice off his arm, which despite being cleaved off, is reattachable for the Gendai. Ultimately, Cal is bailed out by BD-1, and this causes Cal to go down with the lightsaber, assisting his downward fall, and if things didn't get interesting enough, it's here where we learn yet another Force ability. We get a flashback in which Seer and Cal are on a mission, and Seer slams down a group of Stormtroopers with the Force, and in essence, this is the ability we are to learn. So yeah, Force Lift and Slam is our newfound ability, and it's pretty useful, as it lets us rip turrets from the ceiling. It also allows us to lift platforms for navigation and such. There's even an opportunity I had to lift an oblivious Bedlam Raider up and electrocute him. After that, it's the usual navigation and more enemies. Nothing unique to say here unfortunately, before we make our way up to the main elevator. We spy on Dagon and Ravis, in which of course, he reveals information about how their plan is nearly complete. Ravis will go to the Shattered Moon as Dagon knows where the last compass is and whatnot, and then we probably get the only bit of character building for Dagon, as Ravis says that after he's achieved his goals, his debt to him will be complete. With that being said, we go to Free Z, but upon detaching the first chain, Dagon shows up. And to be honest, Dagon spews a lot of typical bad guy dialogue. He is pretty one dimensional. And in his second interaction with Cal, I think a more interesting character was absent. Cal even acknowledges it, stating that his obsession with Tanalor has blinded him. And the way he says it, it almost crosses that line of self-awareness. However, it stops just before it crosses that line. Anyways, Dagon being the aggressive big bad guy he is, attacks Cal, and well, after taking back the tuna, we enter a boss fight with Dagon Gera. I know this probably doesn't matter, but I wondered why Dagon didn't get a new arm by now. Yes, I know it happens later, but this seems like Dagon's putting himself at a major disadvantage. It's another fight with Dagon Gera who has his double bladed lightsaber. The boss fight is kind of samey, but take it with a grain of salt since again, I'm playing on the easiest difficulty. I probably couldn't tell you if the game made him legitimately harder on higher settings. After we've taken enough of his health, a cutscene plays where Dagon holds Cal at a disadvantage, but Bode shows up to save the day, although Dagon manages to escape. Anyways, Cal catches Z up to speed on current events, stating that they've got to get to the Shattered Moon to confront Ravis. And then we enter an escape pod, and use it to exit the Lucra Hulk, because backtracking would be a huge hassle. So the preceding place to go is of course, Kobo's Moon. In the pace of the whole thing, you can feel the climax is about to be upon us, maybe like two or three steps towards it. The story purpose is obviously to confront Ravis, and fight him in a scripted boss battle. So let's get into it. In this sequence, we mostly navigate across the facility. There's that trope of the laser that you have to get out of the way of, and you also get some fun with balloons or something, bouncing around like a motherfucker. We actually get a flashback before we unlock the ability to jump between balloons, where it shows us how Dagon got his arms severed. Anyways, there's not much else to say, aside from the boss fight itself. So when Cal goes to confront Ravis, he discusses a bit of his backstory, how Dagon bested him in combat, and how the Jedi denied him a warrior's death. He refuses to answer Cal's questions, and insists they fight in order for him to get the information he seeks. The boss fight is piss easy on the easiest difficulty, and I was surprised it was actually that easy, even on story mode, so it makes me wonder what it's like on the harder settings. Anyways, there's two phases of the fight, and upon beating him the second time, he recognizes you as the rightful victor of the fight, and reveals that Dagon Gera is at Santari Kree's observatory. As such, Al does offer Ravis the chance to join him and fight Dagon, but that would make things too easy and Ravis declines. He then demands Cal give him his warrior's death that he so sought, and Cal gives it to him when he lunges to attack, and that's the end of Ravis. Our job is done here, and now, it's time to go back to Kobo and confront Dagon. Our journey takes us back to Kobo, in which we proceed to go to this gravelly area of Kobo, to fight through hordes of Imperial forces. Because as it turns out, the Empire's after Dagon and the Bedlam Raiders too. 
This gravelly area is loaded with Imperial enemies who you should all be familiar with. We enter a base, mind trick a stormtrooper to let us pass, and perhaps came across the hardest boss in the entire game, Rick the Door Technician. It's gone. After sweating my ass off, trying to figure out how to beat him, I then took to the skies, as that's where the observatory floats. Yeah, it's in the sky. And on top of using our newfound balloon jump ability, both Imperials and Bedlam Raiders are at each other's throats. There's a lot of jumping, wall running and climbing, and expect to fuck up a ton of times. We do get some combat teaming up with Boat, however. Overall, I'd say the observatory was a suitable place to have our final confrontation with one of the main antagonists of this game. However, the confrontation itself is... We confront Dagon Gera, who looks at a message he's clearly seen 200 years too late, and he is pissed. Cal and Bo demand he give up the compass, and Dagon spews some of his generic dialogue before attacking us. To be fair, they do get a bit inventive with this final fight with Dagon. They give him the illusion of a new arm, as well as taking the fight to the ceiling, because Dagon's on drugs. To be fair though, this is the sort of stuff I wish Disney canon Star Wars games would do more of, on top of the excavator droid earlier in the game. This is effective spectacle if I've ever seen it. This is what you call inspired and inventive. After draining all his health in all his stages, he manages to get the upper hand on Cal, strangling him with the force. Cal, however, manages to rise up. The scene gets a bit trippy, as Santari talks to Dagon through an illusion, in which Dagon is startled enough for Cal to pull a finishing strike on Dagon, finally killing him. And it's gone. Now, perhaps the biggest criticism the story has received is, of course, Dagon Gera. He's a one-dimensional cardboard cutout villain, and when you play the game, you truly feel as if there's something missing with this character. It's like we didn't even get past the first draft on this guy, because the rest of the story is way better. It's even weird for me to say that Ravis was more developed, and he was Dagon's sidekick. Ravis was a character built on honor and serving a code and whatnot. Dagon is just an angry, delusional bad guy with some uninspired dialogue. While Dagon Garrett does not hamper the enjoyability of the story, it is worth noting that he feels empty. They don't really do anything with him. The villains in the last game, and in this game, minus of course Dagon himself, have at least some level of depth and feel like real people. But Dagon in particular has only one goal and motivation, Tanalore. Why? Because he's obsessed with it. It's as shallow as he gets. Dagon is certainly an empty villain that doesn't really offer much. In the context of the story, he never challenges the good guys, he's just an annoying roadblock and that's it. And as a character they built up with flashbacks and whatnot out the arse, you'd expect something better. I don't know why Dagon pales in comparison to pretty much everything else in the game, and I'm not sure how to fix him, because he seems like the most half assed character ever written in a Star Wars game. His personality is generic, his goals and motivations are generic, and I feel he was completely wasted. When I defeated him for the first time, I was like, wait, is that it? Because I was totally expecting something else. Dagon's monologue about the Empire, for example, is probably the most interesting thing going for him, because otherwise, he's just a lame villain, being the central antagonist for most of the game. And again, you would expect something better. With all that being said, we've got the compass, and all appears well with the world. I would have liked something more with Dagon Gera, but the story manages to pick up relatively well despite the underwhelming villain we just killed. It's back to Jedi. And it's here where Cal gives Cordova the compass. And after observing the device, he proudly announces that it can be repaired. Much to the relief of anybody. A home away from the Empire is a possibility. Which was the entire drive for the story. While Cordova does his shtick, everyone else goes outside to celebrate the fact that they can escape the Empire's persecution. Now that I think about it, I think another reason Tanalore was a better plot device than the Holocron from the last game is because Tanalore ties into the overall story more. The game emphasized the near impossible task of destroying the Empire, no matter what you do. It's a reasonable drive for the characters. We know the Empire is going to be overthrown, but this is the point where the Empire is incredibly strong. It took a lot to organize a widespread joint rebellion with a common goal. So yeah. 
We know that the Empire is going to fall eventually, but they do sell the conflict based on what's happening in this game. 10 years after Revenge of the Sith instead of 19. With the Holocron, it didn't tie into other subplots and themes and whatnot. That's why Fallen Order had sort of an iffy story when it comes to connective tissue. Anyways, as I said, the characters celebrate. As we get more banter and chemistry between the characters, Grease brings in the second round of tea, and Cal turns to Seer and asks her whether they'll join the Montana Law, and Seer accepts, indicating that she'll join the Mantis crew at last. She remarks to Cal personally that Jero to Paul would be proud of the Jedi he became, and as such, upon Grease asking, she is going to join their efforts on Tanalore and move the archives for a relocation. Grease, Seer, and Meren go back inside, and Cal and Boat have a personal discussion. And Boat brings up his daughter, Carter. He references how it's hard returning to her, and Cal responds that she'll understand when she sees what he's done for her. Cal personally thanks Boat for all his help, and they have a friendly hug. Boat then decides to go back inside to go record a bedtime story for Carter, and the writers swap Boat out for Merrin. It's probably not much, but having two interactions back to back with these two specific characters is brilliant substance for the story. So on to Merrin and Cal's interaction. The whole scene gets misty-eyed if you catch my drift, and this is where Cal finally decides to embrace what Boat encouraged him to do. So the shippers cream their pants as Cal and Merrin embrace. Now this here, I wanted to talk about. I mentioned how I was never a Cal Merrin shipper, because I saw it as premature. With that being said, however, the romance subplot has grown on me when I started thinking about it. In Fallen Order, any chemistry they might have had was implied, but in Survivor, they made sure to write in actual development. Cal, despite being loyal to an order that no longer exists, has started to lax his dedication to the order's values. Topple this with the fact that he starts developing feelings for Merrin and Boat encouraging him to do what he feels, there was efficiently paced progress in this story. Cal starts off as sort of oblivious when Merrin first kisses him, and Cal loosens his devotion to Jedi ways because of Boat. When it comes to stories that focus on Jedi who survived Order 66, when it's done well, I like how it showcases different Jedi without the restrictions going their own way, without being dictated by an order that no longer exists. So you see stories of Jedi who form romantic attachments, or turn to the dark side, or whatever. So yeah, Jedi Survivor as a Disney canon story actually makes you think about things. I started thinking about the ripple effect of Order 66. How perhaps Cal might not have found himself in the galaxy without it, and he probably would have just been like any other Jedi. How things evolved from Fallen Order 2 is interesting. Cameron Monaghan has a plain looking face if I'm being honest. He honestly could pass off as an extra in the background of any Star Wars movie, and he'd never stand out. In Fallen Order, he starts off as weak and insignificant, and by this point in the game, the fact that he has a plain looking face is something I no longer notice. Cal Kestis has become recognisable as one of THE iconic Star Wars video game characters, like Kyle Katarn for example. Kyle Katarn could easily pass off as generic looking too. Kyle? Kyle Katarn? You're the legendary hero who destroyed Jeric at the Valley of the Jedi? Looked like nothing more than a bantha herder. Yeah, so Cal Kestis being the bane of all the SJWs who called him a boring white male protagonist didn't really look into things that much. I also heard that Cal Kestis in Fallen Order was designed to be sort of like Clint Eastwood in a western because he's very quiet. Yeah, so with that information, Maybe they chose an actor who didn't stand out physically for a reason, and being a straight white male ended up making him one of the best modern Star Wars characters ironically. I don't know if I did an efficient job describing my observations, but that's my take. Anyways, after resting for a bit, Cal ends up checking on Cordova's progress with the compass, and to nobody's surprise, he fixed it. But since this is the middle chapter in a trilogy, you know things can't go completely right. An alarm sounds off in the hidden base, where upon checking, Seer states that the Empire is coming. When Cal turns his head, Boat is holding Cordova at gunpoint. A confused Cal looks at him, and Boat says that he's sorry about this, and Cordova tries to reason with him. And that's where Boat executes him on the spot. 
betrayal. No! Jesus Christ, Boat is a fucking snitch. He tosses a grenade as he runs away with the compass. Upon getting their ground, Cal and Seer find Cordova deceased. And Seer orders Cal to chase after Bode, as he of course has the damn compass. I like how we're right alongside the characters as we've barely got time to think. I imagine most players were completely startled with Bode holding Cordova at gunpoint, and then it clicks. Bode was in bed with the Empire the whole time. As such, we chase straight after Boat, getting onto a speeder. In one of the game's unique set pieces, and chasing after Boat. The controls are primitive, but still engaging. We chase him as the Empire swarms the area. And we even get that shot from the trailer where we throw a scout trooper onto a TIE fighter. After pursuing him at a high speed, we damage his speeder, and he uses his jetpack. And it's here where they have their first exchange after Cal realizes he's a rat. So yeah, Cal confronts Bode, and Bode gives an uncaring reaction to his recent actions. He says he's not giving the compass to the Empire. But when confronted over the Jedi he just killed, he dismisses Cal, telling him that there's other shit going on and Cal better go back to his friends. Honestly, what he says and the way he says it is pretty well handled, as it subconsciously increases your desire for revenge. He shows no remorse for what he's done. On a first playthrough, you'll probably have surface level thoughts like him being a rat, a traitor, a liar and a manipulator. And they emphasize him as the villain for the rest of the game. Then comes the double twist. Where Cal as he's ready to strike Bode learns much to everyone's surprise that Bode too is a force user. He pushes Cal and reveals that he too has his roots in the Jedi Order. Damn, so not only was Bode a rat, but he's also a former Jedi, making his betrayal that much scummier. We get our boss fight with Bode, which doesn't last long, because he launches Cal off the hill, in which Cal plummets down to the ground, and then is knocked unconscious. As Bode flies away on his ship, and then surprisingly, as it fades to black, we get a most unusual prompt, respawn. When I saw that, I was like, Damn, it's Cal Kester's dead? And it was that uncertainty that made me curious, because as we press the respawn button, not knowing what we're gonna get, we switch to Seer as the playable character. She is noticeably stronger than Cal, she one-strikes stormtroopers, and is more durable in general. We opt to kill all Imperial forces, trying to repel them from the base, and after rampaging against the Stormies for a bit, Marin shows up, informing Seer about the assault on the main gate, and so we switch defensive positions, murdering more Imperials. We team up with Marin, making our way to the main gate, and we use giant bomb balls to destroy the AT-ATs. After repelling the main attackers, we make our way back inside. We fight some more Imperials, the usual, until Seer heads straight to the archives. She goes alone, telling Marin to stay and defend the Mantis. Upon heading to the archives, she gives some data to BD-1, who did not accompany Cal in the chase. And who else shows up to confront her than Darth fucking Vader? They meet again, and this time, only one will make it out alive. They play some pretty intense music, as we take on Darth Vader first hand. We know, however, that Seer is only delaying the inevitable. After merely having his time wasted for a few minutes, Vader overpowers Seer despite her best efforts. She does try to crush Vader, a tactic that pretty much never works, and it doesn't heal, and she eventually tries to lunge at Vader, and she makes her final mistake, as Vader counters her attack, and she is impaled with his lightsaber. Vader leaves the area, and Seer, clinging onto life, collapses onto the ground. With Cal showing up to comfort her in her last moments, and the last thing she says is the name of her apprentice, Trilla. And she dies. Ouch. Cal in a similar vein to Obi-Wan, cries uncontrollably. And yeah, this isn't an easy thing to watch. After the fade to black, it's shown that Cal wrapped the bodies of Seer and Cordova, and then summoned the Mantis. The surviving crew, including BD, Marin, and Grease gather, and it's here where they all go back on the Mantis, and upon escaping the place, discuss the recent events. This whole sequence was well done, keeping me in suspense over what was going to happen to all the characters, and the uncertainty of that was absolutely nailed. 
So with that being said, they all discuss among themselves what just happened and what will happen. Merrin reveals that there's only a pitiful three books that survive from the remnants of the Archive. They then discuss Bode. He betrayed them all, and Cal tries to rationalize everything, thinking that he should have been able to sense him. Gree stops his sentence though, and exclaims that everything that happened is on Bode, no one else. Merrin remarks that it's a shame that there's no bounty on his head, and that gets Cal to realize they might be able to track him through a locator beacon, as that's how he tracked Cal to Kobo. After no signal goes through, a hint pops up. BD scans it in, and they've got Bode's location, the Nova Geron system. At first, this may seem like iffy writing, although they do mention that it's possibly a trap, which probably explains how Bode can be tracked. But the four of them know they have to opt in, and so it's the Nova Geron system they must go to. During the trip there, they all still mourn Seer and Cordova, with Grease explaining how he'll never be able to pay Seer back for the credits she lended him that he used to start Pyloon Saloon. So anyways, upon landing, we come across an Imperial base. Now an important plot point is Bode's daughter. Honestly, on the first playthrough, I contemplated whether she actually existed. I don't know. It seemed iffy that Bode would tell the people he was spying on his one true weakness. Hal soon discovers the base is for the Imperial Security Bureau. And since we've already discussed all the Imperial enemies, and you know how the navigation works by now, let's get on with the story. After making his way through the base, Cal confronts the ISB dude in charge, Commander Denvet. This is the guy who got Bo to infiltrate Cal's team in the first place. And Cal, in a display of anger, heavily grips the commander. He knocks him out and proceeds to steal an ISB uniform. Cal and friends sneak past Imperial forces, and given Denvik was forced to call down the alert on him, Cal makes it past unscathed. After mind-tricking an officer to let him past, he makes his way to Bode's quarters, and we have a look around. As it seems, Bode's daughter does indeed exist, as we see a picture of her, along with her deceased mother on the wall. Looking around for a period of time, Cal comes across Carter herself, and it's incredibly awkward. Carter says that her dad Bo told her to quote, pack for a trip, and Cal, realizing that he can't exactly tell Carter that he's got business with her dad that won't end well, Cal opts to help her find her stuffed toy Mookie. Then Bode of course shows up, and both he and Cal keep their distance from each other. Cal asks how he survived the purge, and Bode monologues that he was sent off to intelligence during the Clone Wars. He used the skills he was taught to disappear, and went into hiding. He eventually met a woman named Talia, settled down with her, had Carter, but one day, the Inquisitors came, and Tiala contacted Bo to flee. The Inquisitors ended up killing her, and Bo resorted to the only option he thought he had. He cut a deal with Commander Denvet, hunt other Jedi, and he and his daughter stay protected. Cal calls Bo out on his betrayal, and Bo at this point justifies himself by stating that he's a father, and he did what he did to protect his daughter. He then force pushes Cal, and flees with Carter, with Cal out to pursue him. Although Cal doesn't do this calmly, and in fact, we get a newfound ability this late, and that's embracing the darkness. When so many Imperials show up to surround Cal, he rages out and kills the Imperials in one strike each. This was a great way of conveying Cal's anger, by granting us a new ability. We proceed to chase Bo through the facility, although he ultimately gets away. Merrin comes in to save Cal, and we fight alongside her against Imperial forces. We start off separated, but as we kill more and more enemies, we are essentially fighting together. It certainly helps with our ability to embrace the darkness. Although this leads to a pissed off Cal, remarking how Bode got away again, and after a failed ambush by Denvik, Cal has a choice on whether or not to kill the ISB commander, and Merrin tries to see reason with Cal, reminding him that this is what Bode wants Cal to do, and to not give him the satisfaction. At this point, I was on edge wondering what Cal would decide to do, and he ultimately spares Denvik. So yeah, we regroup on the Mantis, and again, it seems we've lost our lead forever, although there is a solution. Turns out Santari Kree's message to Dagon Gera has some additional instructions in case the compass is gone, 
and that is to activate a control center on Kobo and align the arrays. That there is our final opportunity to get to Tantalor. We head up to the control center in question on Kobo, fight through some Imperial enemies, yada yada, and then we align the arrays. With Z showing up to help us on our ambitious journey while Cal, Grease, and Meryn go through. So yeah, with everything set up, let's go to Tantalor. It's noted how risky everything is, but it's now or never. We're going through the abyss, and there's a chance everyone on the Mantis won't survive. I have to say firsthand that the abyss itself is graphically stunning, and it certainly sells the point of it being exclusive and closed off. Ultimately though, the Mantis narrowly makes it through the abyss. There is Grease being a goofball and yelling longer than he needs to, and Marin ultimately slaps him to quiet down while she kisses Cal. So the entire game, we've been building up to Tanalore, and here it is. As we land, Cal and Marin go out to find Bode. Now as the climax of the game, Tanalore is pretty linear. Everything is on a straight path, and the world does look incredibly nice and unique. And I'd even say it's an improvement over the Fortress Inquisitorius from the last game. There are some Force Echo spots, one of which references a background Jedi from the films. And as such, we make our way to the Jedi Temple Dagon Gera set up 200 years ago. Upon entering the temple, we meet Carter again. And she of course gives the impression that her father has done something bad and Cal and Meryn have showed up to settle things. She, however, is understanding. Her father Bode has done something bad, and something has to be done. So Carter escorts them to Bode, and upon realizing that Cal and Meryn made it through, Bode is pissed. Now during the hike to the temple, both Cal and Meryn decided they would give Bode a chance to stand down. And they offer Bode that chance here, but he declines. Carter in fact pleads for him to listen, but Bode arrogantly states that he decides what's best for his family. And so it's the final boss fight. We do have assistance from Marin, and again, I'm playing on the easiest difficulty. So to sum things up, Bode fights ferociously, but Cal and Marin ultimately have the edge over him. Marin goes to save Carter before she falls, and Bode ends up viciously beating Cal out of fury, throwing punch after punch. And after taking a serious beating, the game emphasizes how brutal it is. Cal embraces the darkness again, via the game's prompt, and we finish off Bode in his boss fight. The hard hits and clashes are nailed by the choreography, and Cal eventually has Bode at his mercy, but still, he refuses to give up, even when Carter tries pleading with him again. He takes his chances and tries to kill Cal for the last time, and manages to have Merrin in a force grip as well. Once again, I was sort of on edge, since they bring both characters, especially Merrin on the brink of death, or seemingly on the brink. It all has to do with presentation. On a first playthrough, I genuinely wondered whether or not Bode would kill Merrin. It was something that made me worried as the scene was playing out. Although she throws a knife at Bode, stunning him, and this is where Cal and Bode draw their blasters on each other, but Cal's gun is the one that still works, and he blasts Bode, which brings him to the ground. Despite no words being said during this moment, I could sort of feel Cal's anger as he shoots Bode the second time to finish him off. It's uncharacteristic of a Jedi, but at the end of the day, Bode was given the chance to stand down, and he refused. And after all the pain he's caused, I sort of inferred that Cal, or maybe a part of him, wanted to kill him. Although it's unconfirmed. I mean, Cal immediately drops the blaster shortly after. So the scene makes you wonder about the character's mentality on screen. I imagine we'll get some self-reflection later in the next game, but to wrap things up, we see Carter back on the Mantis, with Meryn to comfort her. We see Cal closing Bode's eyes right after he killed him, and goes to pick him up. And right afterwards, the three bodies of Seer, Cordova, and Bode are gathered. And Meryn uses her Night Sister magic to burn the bodies in fire, with the surviving characters looking on. We even get this moment where Carter decides to place her stuffed toy Muki on top of her father's wrapped body as it burns. The characters look on, and we get our shot of Cal staring at the bodies, as everyone else decides to leave. And he speaks to Seer posthumously, stating that she saved him on Braca and showed him to walk his own path and what it means to be a Jedi. He promises Seer that he and the others will continue her legacy, but he questions himself, 
as he almost lost his way. And we see Cal having a vision of Sia standing next to him. And it pans over to her lightsaber after the funeral, as Cal walks away. And that concludes the main story. For once in Disney canon, it's a compelling 100% earned finale that you can actually resonate with and take seriously and feels genuine. And that's probably as a licensed game created by Respawn Entertainment and not Disney directly. This actually had a chance to work its ass off as actual art. And I guess I can say mission accomplished. A game that actually makes you think about things and makes you quiet and whatnot when it wants you to be. Bode's betrayal has actual consequences for the story and shit actually happens. So the credits roll and post the credits, Carter is adopted by the Mantis crew and she proceeds to accompany Cal Kestis and friends wherever they go. I imagine Carter's story will be expanded upon come the next game, but for now, she's just there. It's worth noting that after you complete the main story, Force Echoes will appear on all the planets where you can listen to Bode give his thoughts posthumously. As an example, on Jeddah, if you return to the hidden base, you can listen to Bode deciding that he's going to manipulate Cal as he realizes that he has feelings for Marin, which adds context to that scene in the Lucra Hulk. Originally, I was a bit iffy about Bode's betrayal as a plot point, but after listening to a bunch of these force echoes, it's given me appreciation for this story point. He was secretly deceiving everyone in the most sneaky way possible. He was trying to exploit a potential weakness in Cal, but disguised it as encouragement. I also believe there's a conversation Cal and Merrin can have, where they put their romantic relationship aside for now, so come the next game, there's still going to be a lot of development yet to happen. So my thoughts. Overall, the game is great. It's a breath of fresh air. One of the only sincere, genuine things to come out of Disney Star Wars. Game director Stig Asmussen, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, actually seems to care about Star Wars and about telling a good Star Wars story. And I wish him the best as it's revealed that he's leaving Respawn Entertainment to go do other things. So I actually wish him the best on his future endeavors. If it were up to me, I think it would be best if he stuck around for the entire Jedi trilogy, but that's not my decision. And I suppose it's a person's decision if they decide they're done. I just hope Stig's equal is the follow-up, and perhaps go with what they're probably planning for the third game. Although I have to wonder, depending on what Cal's ultimate fate is, what are we going to do with the characters afterwards? We'll see what happens when Star Wars Jedi 3 comes out in a couple of years. In regards to the core game experience, I give Jedi Survivor a 9 out of 10. They substantially improved on the first game, which I personally thought was overrated, but I'm seeing now that they built upon what worked. They went out of their way to improve on the last game, and that I am happy about. What prevents it from being a perfect score are primarily issues like Dagon Guerra and his writing, alongside technical issues. Now, I don't care that much about glitches as much as the next guy, as long as it's not game-breaking, but there have been issues for players, such as on PC, and I can't ignore it. I'm not up to date on the state of the game now, but this was a broken launch for many people. Honestly, the only thing that bothered me personally were characters and objects being out of proportion in cutscenes. And you might have noticed this in my recorded playthrough. I do not discredit others who care about technical issues. I just wanted to point out that as long as it's not game breaking, I don't care that much most of the time. The experience for me flowed just fine, with only a few noticeable things that were off. So with that being said, that is my complete review of Star Wars Jedi Survivor. I am much looking forward to the sequel. Just get Sam Maggot to stay far the fuck away from it next time. And with that being said, I'm JJ Plagiarisms. And until next time, what are stories, but I'm just kidding. I still have one more thing I wanted to talk about. Yeah, you thought I was going to end the video right there? Not a chance. Not until I've spoken about a certain something. So something I omitted in my review of the main story is how during your journey on Kobo, you're going to come across a bounty hunter named Cage Vandar 
after you defeat a bounty hunter affiliated with the Haxian Brood. She presents herself as a former bounty hunter and offers to reward Cal for all the bounties he takes out. So it's a little side quest thing going on here. She'll hang around Pyaloon Saloon as you take out all the bounties and get different rewards as you do so. The bounties themselves are the usual boss battles and upon taking the last one out, you'll see her missing in the saloon. You'll get a hint to go to the place you originally met her, and she tries to shoot you. And as it turns out, she intended to get you to kill all those other bounty hunters to drive your value up, so she could redeem it herself. So it's a boss fight with Cage in which we defeat her, and she still refuses to walk away. And then a certain someone shows up, another bounty hunter. You want to know who it is? Why, yes. It's none other than Bobby Fat. As it turns out, however, he's not after Cal. He's after Cage. And even Cal remarks that he's glad that he's not the target for once. Cage tries to pull out a live thermal detonator, but Cal and Mr. Fat work together. And Mr. Fat has Cage Vander all tied up. Ready for redeeming. Given all the shit Cal's been through, Cal makes the easy choice to let Bobby Fat take Cage away, with him walking away to leave her to her fate. And that's Jedi Survivor for real. Good day. Under the mountain.